It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Our health care system is stretched to the max, with patients being treated in hallways without the privacy and dignity that they deserve. David Jones is a person who knows this firsthand, and he'll be joining us later on today at Queen's Park. On April 8, David's wife was taken by ambulance to St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton due to complications from cancer she had been battling for several months. When the ambulance arrived, she was transferred to a bed in the hallway of the emergency room waiting room, or rather waiting for a room to become available. Tragically, Donna passed away that day without ever being moved to a hospital room. What does this Premier have to say to David, who, like so many others, have had to watch their loved ones be treated in hallways and hospitals across our province? Here. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. First, let me express my condolences to the family. This is something that is a tragic situation, but one that we know that we need to fix. That was one of our major promises when we got elected, was to end hallway health care. That is something that has been developing over 15 years under the previous government's rule. This isn't something that just happened overnight, but it's going to be our responsibility to fix it. Now, it is a multifaceted pro problem. It's not something that there's going to be one solution that's going to change everything overnight. We are looking at enhancing our long-term care facilities, making sure that those patients who are alternate level of care that are in hospitals but don't need to be have a place to go, either home with home care support or to a long-term care home. We know that there are many people that are waiting long periods of time to get out of the hospital to where they need to be to receive the best care. That is what we're working on. I'll have Response. more to say in the supplementary. Supplementary. Well, uh, David uh, found that those caring for Donna during her illness, and I quote, almost without exception, professional and caring, end quote. But he goes on to say in a letter, uh, quote, having observed the health care system during the several months of Donna's illness, I am aware of the challenges, but I believe that in this instance, Donna deserved better. I think we can all agree that Donna deserved better, Speaker. So can the Premier explain specifically what investments he will make in the hospital system to eliminate the sort of hallway medicine that's become all too common in Ontario? Minister. Well, I would certainly agree that our healthcare professionals are doing a wonderful job in situations where that are not ideal for the best provision of care, hallways, storage rooms, auditoriums, that sort of thing. So we need to move away from that and get people into beds in proper hospital rooms, which is for their benefit, but also for the benefit of the healthcare professionals who are doing their best to provide excellent quality care to all patients. We have already made some investments and we're continuing to make more. As I indicated before, it is a multifaceted problem, but we have already announced the, uh, the inception of 6,000 long-term care beds and have put $90 million into hospital care to at least get us through the flu season while we are developing a long-term capacity plan for our hospitals. important point to note, if I could just complete that, is that we are also investing $3.8 billion into a comprehensive— Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Well, it was disappointing for us on this side of the House that the uh, government shorted the flu surge uh, funding by about $10 million compared to what the previous government invested last year, Speaker. No one should have to uh, have a, wa a loved one watch a loved one uh, pass away in a hospital hallway because uh, they can't get a room, Speaker. Uh, we can address the challenges in our health care system, in our hospital system, but we won't get there with an agenda of cuts and so-called efficiencies. Just this week, we've seen the future of a hospital in Grimsby put in doubt due to lack of funding. Will the Premier reject an agenda of cuts and privatization and commit to investments in the hospital system that, they de de that desperately needs it? Minister. Hard to know where to start. There was a lot in that question, but I think the overall theme I completely disagree with. What we are doing is increasing our services in mental health and addictions in hospital care, in health care. We are increasing across the board because we know that people need these services. With respect 
to the flu season, a, a significant amount has been put into that, $54 million. There are no shortages of the flu virus this year. Anyone who wants to receive a flu shot will be able to do so, either at their family doctor's office in a public health unit or in many pharmacies across this entire province. They are available, no shortage. With respect to hospital funding, we are continuing to fund hospitals. We are continuing to make the investments both in terms of renovations. Patient care and safety is an Spons. absolute priority. We are investing in that, and we are going to invest $3.8 billion into yeah. mental health and addiction. Start the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. A worker in his 40s was killed last Thursday when he was pinned between a tractor trailer and the loading dock at a Fair of Foods facility in North York. We don't know his identity yet, but he is the fourth person to be killed working at Farrah Foods, all of whom were temporary workers. Four families have lost loved ones, and we all have a responsibility to make sure this doesn't keep happening. The Minister of Labour is investigating now. Will the Premier wait for their findings before moving ahead with his changes to the Employment Standards Act? Speaker. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I was saddened to hear the news my condolences go out to the family. It's an absolute tragedy. Any time a worker loses uh, their life, it's a tragedy. My thoughts, again, are with the family. The Minister of Labour is currently investigating the situation. The official opposition is attempting, which I find disgusting, is attempting to politicize last week's tragedy, and I won't have anything to do with it. I'm very proud of the legislation we introduced last week, but Mr. Speaker, again, I'm not going to politicize the death of a worker. Here, here. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, whether the Premier likes it or not, he is responsible now for preventable deaths that happen in our province that may get worse with his legislative changes. Amina Diaby was just 23 when she was killed while working at Fiera Foods. Aidan Kazimov was 69 when he was crushed by a transport truck on the job. And Ivan Goliashov was just 16 years old when he died cleaning a Fiera Foods dough machine. All of them were temporary workers. Each and every one of them were temporary workers. None of them should have lost their lives as workers in the province of Ontario. Ontario. The government is proposing major changes, Speaker, to employment standards laws that protect temporary workers. So will the Premier, Order. at a bare minimum, agree to order. wait for the results of the Ministry of Labour investigation before pushing through his changes to the Employment Standards Act? Minister of Labour, Premier, disingenuous, Labor. unbelievable. I ask the Premier to withdraw his unparliamentary comment that I heard. Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We all feel horrible of the tragic incident that's happened uh, in that company. Um, our thoughts are work with the family and the workers. Look at the Ministry of Labour is strongly committed to the health and safety of all Ontarians. And it's through the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which the ministry is investigating through, not the Employment Standards Act, um, Mr. Speaker. So I say to the member opposite, this is tragic. The Ministry of Labour is investigating. The processes are being followed. And I please ask you not to politicize such a tragic event that's happening across Ontario. Supplement, final supplementary. Final supplementary. Stand in this house every day to try to protect workers from being killed on the job. Every single day, if I have to. Friends Don't and families the of these workers are worried that basic protections on the job were not there for their loved ones, and they're. I heard an unparliamentary remark. Would any member over there like to withdraw it? I, I'm not sure who. Minister of Energy. 
Sorry to interrupt the Leader of the Opposition. They're very worried about what they see from this government, cancelling investigations designed to protect temporary workers, gutting legislation that ensured temporary workers would be properly paid and receive de decent treatment on the job. We have an obligation to these four people to learn what we can do uh, to prevent tragic deaths like those from happening Inside again and ensure that they don't ever happen again. Why is this Question. Premier so determined to move ahead with this plan to gut workplace rights and protections? Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you again, oh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I reiterate to the fact that this is the ministry's key role is to investigate the fatalities and health and safety incidences at workplace, and that is under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. It's being we're making sure that those things are followed and they are enforced. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, it's an ongoing investigation. We are very concerned of what happened. The investigation is in process through the ministry, through the Occupational Health and Safety. It has nothing to do with the Employment Standards Act. So again, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Leader of the Opposition, please don't politicize such a tragic event. We are all here to make sure workers in the province are safe. Let the investigation go. Start the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, but I think the government needs to know that treating temporary workers like lesser than workers puts them in a precarious position in the workplace. That is a reality. Here's what one former temp worker said last Order night at a side. vigil for the deceased man. And I quote, it is so sad because this is what happens when we don't have rights and protections at work, end quote. End quote. These are people who work incredibly hard, Speaker, to provide for their families. They don't have money to hire lobbyists, but they pay their bills, they raise their families, and they deserve to be heard. Will the Premier listen? Premier. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker. We want to protect all workers in the province of Ontario. That's why we do have the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And we want workers to have good paying jobs. And we want to create more, better paying jobs in the province of Ontario. With better come to order. So we want more people in the province of Ontario to have better paying jobs, better benefits, better ways of life. That's why we brought in Bill 47, so we can attract those types of businesses and can provide jobs for people. Not Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, working people have some various, very serious concerns about the government's changes to the Employment Standards Act. Whether it's losing a day's pay when you get sick or losing basic on-the-job protections for temporary workers, before the government tears up legislation that protects people on the job, they should wait for the evidence that these changes won't do harm, especially from their own ministry investigating a death on the job. Speaker, with yet another person dying at Fiera Foods. Will the Premier do that? Will he at least wait until the ministry report is complete to ensure that these changes are not going to make things worse? Minister. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is stretching. There is no connection between Open for Businesses Act in Ontario, Bill 47, and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Of course we're protecting workers. We want to protect workers. We are doing that. Mr. Speaker, the best thing that we can do for workers in the province of Ontario is remove the worst burdens on Ontario businesses while preserving the real benefits for Ontario workers so businesses have the confidence in reasonable and predictable regulations, and everyone who works should have the confidence of a good and safe Creek, workplace, come to order. and that come to order. is what we're doing on this side of the place. We are protecting workers and making Ontario open them for business so there are better jobs out there for all the workers in the province of Ontario. Order. Member for Niagara Falls, come to order. 
Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Minister of Economic Development, come to order. Premier, come to order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. I'm learning your writing names. <laughs> Start the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glenbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. Last week, Minister, we tabled the Safe and Supportive Classrooms Act. Now, this legislation is the first step in closing two gaps in Ontario's education system. Mr. Speaker, student safety is always a top priority for this government. Right. But for a while now, We've known that sometimes students have been taught by individuals guilty of sexual abuse towards children. However, these individuals have escaped legal trials because of poorly worded laws. In some cases, it took months and years of complaints from students, parents and teachers before these individuals were removed. Mr. Speaker, this is completely unacceptable. Can the minister explain what our government is doing to make our schools and early years in childcare settings safer? Minister of Education. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the hardworking member from Flamborough Glanbrook, excuse me, for that question because we need to talk about this, Mr. Speaker. Our PC government has zero tolerance when it comes to any form of proven sexual abuse within the school environment be it a student or a teaching colleague. And that's why we've proposed mandatory revocation of teachers and early childhood educator certificates of registration for all sex of or acts excuse me, of proven sexual abuse. Today, a certificate will only be revoked, Speaker, if the specific form of sexual abuse is on the current defined list within the Ontario College of Teachers Act or the Early Childhood Educators Act. We believe very strongly on this side of the House that the previous government did not go far enough, and I know there's members of the NDP caucus that agree with that. Mm -hmm. So we're proposing that Lots. in Bill 48, if a member of the Ontario Teachers College or the College of Early Childhood Educators is found guilty by the respective disciplinary committee of committing any form of sexual abuse, their certificate will be revoked immediately. Here, here. <laughs> Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, and thank you for ensuring that student safety remains a top priority. Ontario's parents also want their children to succeed. However, our students have been falling behind in math, with some students graduating at a disadvantage due to poor math development. Now, the previous government just made things worse with an unproven and experimental curriculum called Discovery Math. Now that we have discovered that it is a failure, can the minister tell me how the Safe and Supportive Classrooms Act will address the level of math achievement in Ontario? Speaker, we know for the past five years there has been an overall decline in the education quality and accountability of math, sco math scores. And as I've said before, and we all echo it, this is absolutely unacceptable. We recognize that more needs to be done, and we will work with teachers to ensure they are prepared to teach the fundamentals of math in order to improve the success of Ontario students. The Safe and Supportive Classrooms Act would require any new teacher seeking to be registered with the Ontario College of Teachers to successfully complete a math knowledge test. All of these changes, Mr. Speaker, will provide more confidence that our PC government is working to make sure that Ontario continues to have the best education system in the here, world. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Uh, Bramptonians have been patiently waiting for a university in our city, and now that dream has been shattered because this government has decided to cut the funding to our new university. The Brampton campus of Ryerson University, in partnership Minister with of Economic Sheridan Development, College, come to order. meant so much like better access to education, job opportunities, and a stronger economy for Ontario at large. But this cut signals that the Conservative government doesn't care about education or job creation, especially in the city of Brampton. Speaker, why does this government keep giving Brampton the short end of the stick? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government has had to make tough decisions across Ontario regarding expensive projects. However, I want to share a quote from a letter sent to me from the President of the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, representing 150,000 students, Danny Chang. He says, quote, at USA, we believe in responsible investment that will effectively improve the lives of students and the future of our society. That is why our students wanted to communicate alignment with your decision on October 23rd. We believe that the Ontario university sector should ensure that any new, new or growing university institutions and campuses are financially sustainable. Speaker, Response. Ontario students know the importance of fiscal sustainability, and it is time for the NDP to recognize that as well. Uh, Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time and time again, the Conservative government has demonstrated that it does not care for the people of Brampton, and now it is taking away a university in our city that would have created jobs, economic development, and provided a much-needed campus close to home for those living in our city. Sadly, yesterday, not a single government member from the Brampton side stood up to be counted on yesterday's motion to preserve funding to our university. Does this government not believe that Brampton is worth the investment? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government has had to make tough decisions about projects across Ontario. I repeat, I want to share the perspective of Leo Grork, President and Vice-Chancellor of Trent University. He says, quote, in a situation in which the system is characterized by a lack of students, creating entirely new campuses takes students away from existing campuses at a time when they are scrambling to find students they need to fill the spaces they already have available. He goes on to say that we, quote, cannot expect a provincial government that is trying to wrestle with its deficit to pay for new campuses at a time when there is no pressing need to establish them. The Ford government has made the right decision. Unquote. Speaker, the people of Ontario expect us to make tough decisions and clean up the fiscal mess left behind by the Liberal government. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member from Milton. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Yesterday, the Minister had the opportunity to represent our government at the Empire Club to address important issues we currently face. For the last 115 years, the Empire Club of Canada has hosted debates on some of the most important topics. Leaders have participated in forums discussing the issues of the day. Today, our government is faced with 15 years of liberal mismanagement that has left our province $15 billion in deficit. Our government for the people has made a clear priority to address the concerns we've heard during our campaign. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is focused Question. and remains clear and consistent. Can the minister tell the members of this legislature what he was able to share yesterday's events? To the environment, conservation, and parks. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member from Milton. It was an honour to speak on behalf of the Premier and the government yesterday to the Empire Club. What I was able to tell them was that our government has wasted no time in, term, in terms of putting in place the actions that will make life more affordable for Ontario families. Cancelling the cap-and-trade program, ending drive clean, scrapping wasteful Green Energy Act, freezing driver's license fees and other fees. These are just the beginnings of trying to put more money in the pockets of the people. 
We talked about the introduction of the Making Ontario Open for Business Act and how that's going to reduce red tape, unlock thousands of skilled trades jobs for Ontarians, and repeal the worst parts of Bill 148, which has burdened Ontario with unnecessary regulation. We talked about the completion of a line-by-line -line audit, which is going to help put our finances back on an even track. And, Mr. Speaker, this is just the beginning. Like the rest of the members Bonds. of the government, I'm proud to be part of a government that's yeah. standing up for the people and working to make life more affordable yeah. for families. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for making it clear that this government is working hard to ensure the voices of all Ontarians are heard and our commitments are kept. Speaker, back to the minister. During election time, the people of Ontario were clear. They were tired of dealing with Liberal government that acted in their own political self-interest. They were tired of being imposed, taxes being imposed on them, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians called for a government that would finally listen to the people. Mr. Speaker, one of the concerns facing this province is a threat of climate change. Mr. Speaker, we see more frequent storms resulting in flooded basement, structural damage, and costly cleanups. Can the minister tell us? what he was able to emphasize on at the entire Empire Club in terms of how our government will address the concerns like we're facing in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Milton. Um, we talked about how the uh, elimination of cap and trade is going to save Ontario families $264. We talked about the threat of the imposition of a federal carbon tax that could add hundreds of hundreds, even $850 to the price of our Ontario families. We also, though, talked about Ontario's climate leadership. We talked about how Ontario is on track to meet its Paris 2020 targets. We talked about the plan that we'll bring forward next month that will be a balanced plan that will balance the economy and the environment. But Mr. Speaker, we talked mostly about the importance of the leadership of our Premier, Premier Ford, how he is going to be meeting with other Premiers. He is meeting with other leaders across the, uh, the country to make Bonds. sure that the unconstitutional tax that the, the Prime Minister Trudeau is bringing forward will not be brought forward, that Ontario families will not be punished, sure. will meet our environmental objectives. Sure. Start the clock. The next question is the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yesterday in this House, I asked the Minister about cancelled services at West Lincoln Memorial Hospital, specifically obstetrics and surgical programs. Following my question, I heard from Frank Trivieri, a constituent from the riding who feels this action is a slippery slope to a hospital closure. In January, he suffered a heart attack and received exceptional care at this hospital. Frank asked me what the minister meant when she stated she would be maintaining services, and I could not give him a clear answer because she wasn't clear on what services will continue and which will not. Speaker, will this minister be honest with the people of Niagara West and explain what services will not continue and why there was no consultation with the hospital or the people of Niagara? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, we did have a discussion about the West Lincoln Hospital here yesterday, and I indicated to the member that I recognize this is a matter of concern to all the residents in Grimsby and surrounding area. And I can tell you again that the member from Niagara West has done an excellent job in bringing the community's concerns to me. An absolutely outstanding job. In, in reiterating those concerns and bringing forward considerations that have been brought to him by members of the community. So, I'll say again today what I said yesterday. Hospital services will continue to be provided at West Lincoln Hospital, and the Ministry of Health is in active discussions right now with the Lynn, with Hamilton Health Sciences, and with the West Lincoln Hospital to determine Spons. the best way to provide care to, to uh, patients that need services and where that care will be provided in the short term. But in the long term, I can tell you there will be. Thank you. 
Well, Speaker, again, this minister is playing word games with the people of Niagara when it comes to their health care. The chief of staff of the hospital resigned because of this government's for failure Niagara West, to come consult. To the Member for Niagara West, come to order. And a petition is being circulated Member for by Niagara Member West, from West, come to order. Against his own government. Will the minister confirm today what, whether the obstetrics and surgery programs will continue? Member for Niagara West is warned. I think the question was the question put. I think the question was put. Response, Minister. Well, I think that there's a short answer to this. I have been very clear with my communications throughout, as has the member from Niagara West, as has the Premier who visited the West Lincoln Hospital last Friday. We are all working on a solution that is going to benefit the people of Grimsby and surrounding area. Patient safety is an utmost concern. We're all looking at that. But we are also very concerned that the hospital remain open to provide services to the people that need it. So a solution is being formulated now that is going to take into consideration all of those factors, but the hospital in West Lincoln is going to remain open. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Uh, good morning, Premier. Uh, it's great to see you. Premier, there's so many things that we haven't had a chance to talk about, like how proactive inspections have been stopped by your government, making workplaces and workers' rights more at risk, or how your finance minister has been unable to get the signature of the controller on this year's public accounts, or how the costs from all the programs you've cut aren't reflected in the public accounts, or where the proceeds from cap and trade are going either. So, Speaker, most importantly, how workers' rights and wages are being stripped in Bill 47, and at the same time, the Premier can hire his ex-party president and a campaign advisor to $350,000 a year jobs Government here in Ontario. Order. So my question to the Premier is this, Speaker. Does the Premier think that six friendly questions today is a good thing? Premier, that's what you're using your question for? I saw, well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I still, I don't, I, I'm not too sure where the member of Ottawa South is going, but I find it pretty rich. I find it pretty rich that this member was part of the $15 billion deficit that's been put on the backs of businesses, put on the backs of the people here in Ontario. The member. The member from Ottawa South was personally responsible for destroying the financial books of this province. Yep. He destroyed 300,000 families that lost their jobs yep. under the Liberal government. We have the highest hydro rates in North America hey. under his government. He, gives them, he, he wants the highest carbon tax anywhere in the entire world. We are facing $338 billion, the largest subnational debt in the world because of this government. Thank you. Government side, come to order. Government side, come to order. Government members come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I think I put six questions in there and I didn't hear an answer to one of them. So one question a day, 22 minutes of debate come to order. on a substantive bill like Bill 47. No participation on the financial oversight committees of this legislature just doesn't cut it for the 1.1 million people who voted Ontario Liberal, or actually the 1.4 or the 1.4 member from the Green Party. This legislature has recognized the importance of the popular vote in the business of this legislature, order. most recently in 2003. Side, come to order. In 2003, a motion was passed in this legislature that supported the seven members of the NDP and the 600,000 people who voted for them. Two weeks ago, we put forward an amendment that mirrored that motion. You voted it down, supported by the NDP. So, 
Mr. Speaker, Chet. my question to the Premier is, will the Premier commit to passing a motion that will ensure the voices of the more than one million people in this province are fully supported in this legislature and can participate in a fulsome way in the business of this legislature? Premier, will you commit to that? Yeah. Before I recognize the Premier to respond, I would remind all members to please make your comments through the chair. Premier. This is what he's wasting his question on. I know. <laughs> through, <laughs> through you, Mr. Speaker, again to the member from Ottawa South, I just find it so rich and so ironic. He's talking about oversight. There was no oversight for 15 years for the taxpayers. Yeah. We have an inquiry going on. We have a select committee going on to find out who got rich off this government, the Liberal government. I'm telling you, Mr. Speaker, we've never seen more backroom deals, more scams, more people getting their pockets lined under this government than any government. I caution the Premier. I'm going to caution the Premier on, on that sort of language. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kitchener South Hester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. World class education means accommodating all students, including those with unique learning needs. Research shows that service and therapy animals provide a wide range of emotional, physical support for students. Parents across the province have expressed the need for service animal supports in school boards. Today, though, only approximately half of Ontario's 72 school boards have a policy or guideline in place to address the needs of students with service animals. That means half of the school boards and families are being left behind to try and navigate the system. Minister, what will this government do to provide consistency across the province when it comes to student access to service animals? Mr. Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I would like to thank the member from Kitchener South Hespler for the question. She's an amazing MPP, uh, an amazing advocate for support dogs, and most importantly, an amazing mom to Kenner and his siblings. And I would like to share with the House that after 15 long years of inaction, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to say that it's the PC government that's taking this issue of support dogs very seriously, and we have taken the first step to get it right. It has only been 120 days, and our government is proposing a legislative amendment to the Education Act that would require every single school board in this province to put in place a policy to address this important and unique need. Mr. Speaker, I stress the fact that currently there is not one consistent policy in the province, and we owe it to our students to get it right. If the proposed amendment is passed, and I hope we have support from all of the members Response. of the House, so. school boards will be directed to have a publicly available, clear and fair policies regarding support animals. Here, here. Thank, you. Supplementary. thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. First off, thank you for those kind words. I'm very glad to hear that this government for the people is taking action to put our students first. My constituents have been participating in consultations via fortheparents.ca. The people of Ontario are pleased that they have a say in what student education will look like. And I'm sure they will also have a lot to say around student access to service animals in our schools. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, can, can you confirm that my constituents and all Ontarians will have the ability to submit opinions on what these policies and guidelines will look like. Minister. Thank you very much. And Speaker, it's my pleasure to rise in the House and say to the constituents of Kitchener South Hespler and to all across Ontario, thank you for exercising your voice. We want to hear from you. If you haven't already participated in fortheparents.ca, we are listening. And with regards to support animals, service animals in particular, all members of the public will have an opportunity to provide input on the policy directive that would be issued to the boards. That includes families, education partners, advocacy, advocacy groups, and community agencies. It will help us best to develop the best form of guidelines for school boards and develop policies that will work for students with special needs. 
needs. Parents deserve a clear and transparent process for requesting service animals, no matter where they live, Mr. Speaker. And I'm proud that our PC government is listening and striving Response. to ensure every student and family can be, will be accommodated here, in our here. education system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier claims to believe deeply in respect for taxpayers and transparency in government. Order. Government side will come to order. Government side will come to order. Just a sec. The clock hasn't started. We haven't started the clock yet. Government side will come to order. Start the clock. Speaker member for Essex. Enthusiasm from the members of the government. Maybe they might want to wait until I'm done the rest of the question for, to show their enthusiasm. Yeah. Speaker, that's why it was, uh, this was really shocking to see the uh, the Premier refused to tell reporters how much taxpayer money he'd be spending on his plan to roll out these new Welcome to Ontario billboard signs up at the border. Can he tell us now, Speaker, how much of the people's money he'll be spending on this plan? Side, come to order. Premier, that's money it will attract. Where's every penny? Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, that's and to the member of Essex. Matter of fact, we're going to put a sign up right down the street from the member's home there to make sure people know that Ontario is open for business. We're going to make sure the world knows and the millions of people that cross every border across Ontario that we now have a province that encourages business to open up because we're going to lower the hydro rates. We're going to create a business-friendly atmosphere to invest. We're going to make sure we don't lose the 300,000 jobs that the previous administration lost. 96% of the vote, they supported the Liberals. They were part of destroying this province. We're going to make sure we have this province thriving. We're going to create tens of thousands of new jobs. We're going to attract new businesses. And again, Ontario is open for business. Government side, come to order. Minister of Transportation, come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. We don't care whether it's billboards or bumper stickers from Deco labels. We just want to know how much it's going to cost the people of the province. We have fun with us. Come on. Tell us how much it's going to cost. Speaker, the Premier also committed to some additional taxpayer spending this week. He committed to bilateral trade talks with the province of Saskatchewan, a province that we do about 5% of interprovincial trade with, which is especially interesting considering Ontario and Saskatchewan were the only two provinces to skip a meeting of interprovincial trade this week, this past week. Speaker, where, uh, that's where the other 95% of inter interprovincial trade is actually being discussed. Can the Premier tell us how much of the people's money he'll be spending on trade talks with his friends in Saskatchewan? Premier, members, please take your seats. Another law. Nice the through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I was proud to host Premier Scott Moe. He's like-minded. In, in, in total, Mr. Speaker, we do $11 billion of trade. But BMO, BMO came out with a study. It's costing us $50 billion a year as a country that we don't even have proper interprovincial trade. We have regulations, over regulations. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're going to blaze a new trail because BMO also said it's costing Ontario 15 to 20 
billion dollars to the economy. But I can make sure I can make sure that we're gonna we're gonna have a deal with Saskatchewan. And then you're gonna see all the other provinces hop on board because we talk about the USMCA deal. Response. We can't even get trade down with our within our own country. But under our leadership, we'll make sure it happens. We'll make sure we create jobs. Stop the clock. Both sides of the House, come to order. Member for Essex, come to order. Premier, come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has committed to being responsive to the needs of Ontarians, and most importantly, we are listening. While the Liberals ignored the business community and ignored the people, this government is working day and night to get Ontario's finances back on track, something my constituents are very happy to hear. That's why the President of the Treasury Board has been conducting roundtables and stakeholder meetings with organizations across the province. In fact, a few weeks ago, I welcomed him to Waterloo Region, where we met with job creators and constituents to discuss the state of Ontario's economy and finances. Can the President of the Treasury Board please inform this House who he has consulted with over the past few weeks? The President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener Conestoga for that excellent question. Our goal is to transform government to one that is both efficient and responsive to the needs of the people. This is the only way that we can repair the damage to both the public finances and the public trust caused by Liberal mismanagement. Yep. That's why the Planning for Prosperity consul consultations have evolved from a have evolved for, Essex, come to order. for the people to a conversation with the people for as Essex, come to order. working from the other side. Over the past two weeks, I have visited four chambers of Congress, two colleges and universities, two innovation hubs, a dairy farm, a greenhouse farm, and many more. I have heard from hundreds of Ontarians who know that help is on the way and that Ontario is now open for business. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the President of the Treasury Board for his answer. Mr. Speaker, businesses across Ontario are being suffocated by red tape. My constituents are also concerned about how the legacy of poor financial management left behind by the Liberals will impact them and their families. In fact, this sentiment is the same toward the federal Liberals. A recent survey shows the majority of Ontarians surveyed preferred balancing the budget compared to running a deficit. Despite the opposition's insistence that we are nothing more than a party of cuts, it is this premier and government that is actually listening to the people and building up Ontario. Can the president of the Treasury Board inform this House as to what he has heard during his consultation with Ontarians? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, for you, thank you to the member for that question. I can say that our government for the people is taking the necessary steps to finally get this province back on track. Here, here. We will be cutting red tape. We will be cutting inefficiencies, and Mr. Speaker, we will be cutting here, here. the deficit. Here, here, here. Everywhere, everywhere I've gone, I've been hearing a common theme. I hear that red tape is haunting businesses. That's what we need to improve and modernize this province's services, and that the needs of business owners are finally being addressed. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians want change. They want a government that is efficient, effective, and receptive. To those who have participated in our consultations, I say, we hear you. We are working nonstop to get this province back on track, Mr. Speaker. And I say again, Ontario is open for business. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Conservative government has announced that they will be releasing the results of their 100-day review of Ontario's social assistance system on November 8. 
However, they have been surprisingly tight-lipped about how exactly they are conducting this review and who has been involved in its development. Can the minister tell us exactly who she has consulted during this process, and can she explain the steps her ministry has taken to make sure that the public has been engaged, particularly those who have lived experience with the Ontario Disability Support Program and Ontario Works? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much for the question. It's really great that the NDP is finally starting to talk about this important issue, which should be in their wheelhouse, but they're really neglectful that they really haven't engaged very much in the legislature. We were very clear when we order. assumed office that we were going to hit the pause button on the previous Liberal administration's patchwork, disjointed system when we repatriated the five ministries that I'm now responsible for. When we did that, we said we would bring in a 1.5 percent increase on ODSP and on works right across the board, and that's happened. And we've we've started to engage stakeholders, and we'll be ready in a couple of weeks to outline the positive changes that we'll be making uh, as a government to lift more people out of poverty and back on track where they're able and where they're not, we're going to be able to provide additional supports. But I can assure the member opposite that we have been engaging with stakeholders and we've been engaging with previous research and previous Liberal administration, and we're going to continue to make those supports. But I can assure you, one in seven, per, one in seven people living in poverty in the province of Ontario is Thank you. Order. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister, you might remember the Mike Harris government that actually cut social assistance rate by nearly 22 percent, and your government that has also cut social assistance King rate Bond, come cut off the basic income. Over the past For month, Bond, I've spoken to members of my community, social policy experts, and leading advocacy organizations, and I have yet to find anyone that was invited to take part in the minister's review. It's shocking to hear that this Conservative government is not including in the process the very people who will be impacted by their decision. Does the minister think that it's smart policymaking to make unilateral decisions without consulting the people whose lives she is directly impacting? Does she simply think that she knows best and understands social assistance better than anyone that is currently receiving it? Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. Um, look, the member opposite is misleading the House by suggesting that there's been a cut because of the member knows the rules. She'll withdraw. Withdraw. The member opposite knows we raised rates by 1.5 per cent across the board for people in ODSP and Ontario Works. We have a $10 billion program in social assistance that 1 million people in Ontario are on, and Order. one in seven people in this province are living in poverty. What we were doing in the past is not working, and Order that's why West I will stand here to make sure that the best social safety net in this province is a compassionate society. The best social circumstances are when those people who can work are in the labour force, and I will remind the member opposite the best for for social one, program in, in the province of Ontario is a job. <laughs> The House comes to order. <laughs> Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, come to order. Minister of Municipal Affairs, come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Member for Hamilton South, sorry, Ottawa South, come to order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. While the federal Liberal government is dreaming up new ways to tax the people of Ontario, our government for the people is working hard to create jobs and bring new investment to our province. Last week, we introduced the Making Ontario Open for Business Act which we have received an outpouring of support from people across this province. Here, here. Our government continues to stand up for workers and job creators, and I'm happy to see our government working with other governments who have the same goals in mind. Just yesterday, the minister and Premier Ford met with the Premier of Saskatchewan. 
And unlike our opposition members over here, you know, we recognize the importance of Saskatchewan as part of Canada to the agricultural community and to stand up to the federal government, which I'd like to see this party do more. Could the minister please inform the House of what our government is doing to Question. strengthen the economy? Minister of Economic Development, John Creation and Trade. Honourable colleague, for the, uh, for the question, yesterday the Premier and I did welcome uh, Premier uh, Scott Moe uh, to our province to discuss how our governments can best serve our people and fight the federal government's carbon tax. The Premier's went so far, and I agree, to call this new federal tax a scam. And Canadians agree that it's a scam, Mr. Speaker. The federal government is trying to bribe Canadians with their own money, but the people aren't falling for it. Under the federal Liberals' carbon tax, we would all be paying higher gas prices, higher home heating costs, and thousands of people would lose their jobs. The good news is, Speaker, that Canadians from coast to coast to coast are fighting back, and that fight started under the leadership of Premier Scott Moe and former Premier Brad Wall. Killing the federal carbon tax is the right thing to do for families, for workers, for businesses, for jobs, and I'm glad to have sat in on that meeting and watched this wonderful Premier fight for the workers and families of Ontario, along with Premier Scott Moe. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Speaker, and to, uh, thank you for the minister for your uh, response. I'm glad to hear that our government is joined by others in our fight against the federal Liberal government's carbon tax. And I'm also glad to hear that interprovincial trade was discussed. Reducing interprovincial trade barriers will provide real benefits for the people of Ontario. <laughs> While the federal government is creating new tax grabs, our government is taking action to put more money in the pockets of hardworking people of Ontario. Through you, Speaker, could the minister please outline how the Memorandum of Understanding will create opportunities for Ontario families in our province? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the honourable member again for the question. Yesterday, Premier Ford, on behalf of the government of Ontario, was pleased to sign a Memorandum, memorandum of Understanding uh, with Premier Scott Moe, Premier of Saskatchewan. The MOU is a sign of our shared commitment to reducing interprovincial trade barriers, which continue to impede job creation and investment throughout Canada. We've heard from Ontario's job creators that this is one of the primary obstacles to attracting new investment and jobs to Canada. It's very important that we act now. And Mr. Speaker, I was proud to sit in on that meeting. I've been around here for 28 years, and I can't name you five interprovincial trade barriers we've ever brought down in that time. We've built up more and more and more, and it's a shame that the NDP don't respect the 11 to $13 billion worth of two-way trade we do with Saskatchewan. If we bring down trade barriers with Saskatchewan, we'll do more trade, we'll do more exports outside of Canada, and the rest of the provinces will follow. Finally, we have a couple of quick Premier Ford and Premier Lowe who want to get the ball rolling. And I just wish to inform the House, I, once the ovation started, I couldn't hear the minister who had the floor, and I had to stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We all know there is huge potential in this province for mining, which will benefit Ontario's and Canada's economy. However, nothing can be done unless the groundwork. The groundwork is laid and done, and, and if we establish good relationships with our First Nations in Ontario. Industry players, mining companies are at the table. First Nations. Indigenous communities are at the table. Municipalities are at the table. Can the Premier explain to us why his government, just like the Liberal government before him, is not ready to come at the table or prepared to roll up their sleeves and get to work? Premier. To Northern Development Mines. Third Energy Northern Development Mines. Well, thank you. Just, just, just taking that drive with the Premier in and out of beautiful Algoma country, Mr. Speaker, I think it was abundantly clear that this government is at the table. 
creating extraordinary opportunities for Indigenous communities in Northern Ontario and municipalities to mutually benefit from the resources that we develop and the resources that we share with this country and contribute to our economy and to the global economy. There's no question that this is a great opportunity, Mr. Speaker. There are more Indigenous people employed in mining than any other sector in this country. And although we'd love to see those numbers improve across sectors, we're very proud of the traditions in Northern Ontario that we have. We're committed to developing more mines, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the NDP, who, who bought in 97 per cent of the time to the more than 380,000 regulations that shut mining down, that shut forestry down, Mr. Speaker, and shut Northern Ontario out of its rightful place to contribute to the economy of this great province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Start the clock. Supplementary. Uh, again, to the Premier, he, along with the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs, and I, were up at White River to open up the Heart Gold Sugar Zone mine, right? And let's be clear, the only thing this government did was cut a ribbon there. Exactly. That, that was the prime opportunity for this government to acknowledge the lands of the traditional territory of the Pickmobert First Nations people. However, neither the Premier nor the Minister took that opportunity or offered that respect. It's hard to think that this government will come to the table fully prepared when they're not willing or even interested in building a trusting relationship with Indigenous people. When the Premier makes statements, and I'll quote, if I have to hop on that bulldozer myself with Dick on the other one, we're going to start building the roads to get the mining done. Does the Premier believe that does he really believe that making statements of this kind and jumping on a bulldozer will advance any development in the ring of fire with the Indigenous communities that are there or the mining companies? Minister. It's a bit of a take on words, Mr. Speaker, but it's true we were up there to cut the ribbon and to cut tape as recently as a couple of weeks ago when my office had to break through to make sure that Hart Gold could actually open up the project. Isn't that right through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier? Thank goodness that they have a government, as the CEO said, that is open for business and committed to mining in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And as it goes for the Ring of Fire, this is a tragedy. For seven years, it's been bogged down. Down, Mr. Speaker, in the kind of bureaucracy yeah. Member for that Timmons, my come meeting with leaders of, uh, in, in the ring of fire, in the propinquity of ring of fire, Member for said Algoma we need to Manitoulin, break through. Come to order. We're engaged with those communities. We're meeting with those communities. Municipalities and Indigenous communities in that area can look forward to a renewed relationship that delivers resort, uh, results, builds a corridor to prosperity. Mr. Speaker, Pause. unlike the No Digging Party, we're going to get our shovels out and our bulldozers up. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Both sides. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I was very pleased to hear that the Minister and our Premier devoted time in their busy schedules last week to visit our northern ridings and spread the great news that Ontario is finally open for business. Yeah. And I'm happy to hear that our government will be working with our northern partners to help rebuild a robust economy. I was also pleased to hear of an announcement regarding the wolf transfer to our friends in Michigan. There are many questions about whether this transfer will be done in a safe and humane way and if the wolves will be able to adapt to their new homes south of the border. Mr. Speaker, can the, through you, can the minister please tell the House how the transfer will take place and how this will benefit both Ontario and Michigan moving forward? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Brantford Brant for that uh, question. This partnership will see wolves move from Ontario to Michigan's Isle Royale National Park. It's part of a mutual uh, commitment 
for conservation between their state and our province. Wolves play a critical role in managing moose population, preventing overgrazing of vegetation, and sustaining the ecosystem dynamics. With very few wolves remaining at Michigan's Isle Royale National Park, a natural population recovery unlikely, Ontario has agreed to move several Ontario wolves during the winter months. Mr. Speaker, the wolves will be transported in the safest possible way. It is expected to take no more than two hours to transport the wolves via helicopter from the current home to the new home in Michigan. Collars will be placed on each of the wolves in order to track them in, in the wild by radio and satellite, Response. and in doing so, Mr. Speaker, we'll be able to learn just how they're adapting to their new environment. Here, here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his response. It is promising to hear that partnerships such as this one are creating opportunity on both sides of the border. I am relieved to hear that this process of transferring the wolves can be done in a safe and humane way. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that last year alone, two-way trade between Ontario and Michigan totaled $84 billion. Wow. This is a significant number and suggests that we must continue to strengthen this relationship. Relationships must remain strong between Ontario and our neighbours to the south, and the partnership demonstrated by this wolf transfer suggests positive news moving forward. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Can he please tell us how leaders in Michigan are responding to the news of Ontario being open for business? Yeah. Minister. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for his question. My team at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is very pleased to participate in this collaborative initiative with Michigan and the United States National Park Service. There are many great things being said from our counterparts in Michigan. Governor Rick Schneider said Michigan is proud to be part of this international effort to return a viable wolf population to Isle Royale, and we appreciate the partnership provided by Premier Ford in the effort. If that's not enough, Mr. Speaker, Isle Royale Superintendent Phyllis Green stated, the National Park Service appreciates the support of Premier Ford and Governor Schneider in helping restore predator-prey dynamics in the Isle Royale National Park. Mr. Speaker, despite the howling coming from the other yeah. side of the All right. okay. Northern Ontario is open for business. We have another question. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Many of my constituents on Hamilton Mountain, as well as others across the province, have entered into agreements with the Green Ontario Fund for rebates on work being done to improve energy efficiency in their homes. In July, the government cancelled the program, saying that it would not honour any agreements if the work was not completed by tomorrow, October 31st. Contractors have been working hard to meet that deadline, but they're finding it impossible. Bob Elliott is the owner of Ken Mason Insulation in Hamilton. As a contractor, he is finding it impossible to complete orders by the deadline set for the Green Ontario Fund. Manufacturing, delivery and installation of windows and doors takes time. That time runs out tomorrow. Delays happen, Speaker. Ventrelux windows and door system have pointed out the impact of rain days and manufacturing def defects. These realities of the industry appear to be lost on this government. Will the minister extend the unrealistic deadline Question. so that contracts entered into in good faith will be honoured? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for her question. Um, Mr. Speaker, the government's been very clear with the people of Ontario. We were elected on a mandate to end the cap-and-trade program and to end the programs that it was subsidizing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the program of which the member speaks was an example of, a, of an out-of-control subsidy program, would literally have cost the people of Ontario hundreds of millions of dollars. But we did make it clear, um, in fact, in June, we made it clear that this program would be winding down. Originally, we talked about the work being completed by August 31st. Mr. Speaker, we extended that deadline. We extended that deadline in good faith uh, to 
support the kinds of, uh, of people that, uh, that the member is speaking to, and that deadline is now October 31st. Mr. Speaker, the only responsible thing to do when winding down a program, when stopping money flowing into the government coffers, is to end the program and end the cost to taxpayers. So the, we will not be extending the, uh, the deadline. We have, been, we have extended Spots. it on one occasion, and we want to be clear that when we said we were going to cancel the program, Thank you. That concludes the time for question period this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 38C, the member for Windsor West has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services concerning the 100-day review of social assistance, and this matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Government House Leader has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I seek unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding extending the meeting of the General Government Committee on Wednesday, October 31st. Government House Leader is seeking unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding a committee. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Government House Leader. Speaker, I move that notwithstanding the order of the House dated October 25th, the Standing Committee on General Government be authorized to meet until 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, October 31st, for public hearing on Bill 32. Fifth Bay of Quinty is moving that notwithstanding the order of the House dated October 25th, the Standing Committee dispense. Dispense. Is it the pleasure of the House of the motion carried? Yeah. Carried. Take that back down to the table. Okay. <laughs> there being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.